I'm very grateful indeed for this opportunity to speak to you today and uh, in the context of reflection on interreligious dialogue, intercultural dialogue as a means of bringing people closer together, as a means of uh, dealing with difference and diversity, and as a means of moving forward on our journey together, uh, sharing our common humanity. If I can just briefly introduce myself, I'm Irish, as you can hear. Uh, I did study at University College Dublin, but I also studied at the University of Louvain. And here in Rome, I studied quite some time ago now uh, to become a Catholic priest. I've worked as a Catholic priest in England for 22 years in the Midland Diocese of Birmingham. And for the past 14 years, I was in a very multi-ethnic uh, city probably one of the most uh, multi-ethnic in England, namely the town of Wolverhampton. Uh, it had huge immigration in the 50s and in the 60s from uh, India and Pakistan by way of Uganda, and then from the Caribbean in the 60s. There was already a very large Irish emigrant resident community, as well, of course, as the native English. So I've been used to dealing with a variety of cultures, both at an ecumenical level, as well as at an interchurch level, on a very, very uh, down-to-earth basis in a small town in the context of a parish. And for the past uh, 14 months or so, I've been privileged to serve the Bishop's Conferences of the European Union as their General Secretary. That means that uh, 28 Bishop's Conferences nominate a delegate to what's called Comisi, the Commission of European Bishop's Conferences, and we largely focus on uh, accompanying the European process of integration, monitoring and following the development of legislation in the European Union, particularly as it affects church and society. And we also aim drawing on the social teaching of the Catholic Church to contribute to the ongoing uh, commitment to the European project. When, uh, and I'm very grateful indeed to Mark and to Elvira and to our distinguished chairman as well, with whom I shared a motor car this morning, and I learned an enormous amount about the uh, Intercultural uh, Association. So I think you're doing absolutely wonderful work, and I'm delighted to have had this very much last minute tutorial on the way here to the conference this morning, and I feel very privileged to be among you. I decided though, when I was invited to speak, that I would reflect on uh, what I saw as the challenges and difficulties of intercultural dialogue. And that's why I mentioned narrative. And we are in Rome, and I'm a Catholic priest, so I hope you won't mind, uh, and you won't consider it special pleading, if I start with the current challenges of the Catholic Church. Pope John Paul II, soon to be declared a saint, uh, opened up the idea of a new evangelization. A new millennium was about to begin, and there were indications that the church was failing to get its message across. Church congregations were declining for a whole variety of reasons across the Western world. There was a growing ignorance of Christianity, a growing hostility, indeed, in many societies towards the Christian principles. And so it was quite clear that if it were to survive at all, the church had to start evangelizing again. Now, in my view, the central crisis is one of narrative because Judeo-Christian religion is based primarily on a story. It's the story which we find in the pages of the Bible, both Old Testament and New. Two chapters, we call it the Old Covenant or the Old Testament and the New Testament or the New Covenant. And they concern a relationship between God and his people which occurred in history. There's a lot of myth, of course, but there is a historical hard core to the account. And it's a story, really, of God's love, of him wrestling with his people, of him leading his people, of him being angry with them, but of him continually demonstrating, as a good father does to his child, that he loves them. And it is the conviction of those of us who are Christian that the greatest gesture of love which he showed was in sending his only son, in entering into our world in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who became, through his passion, death, and resurrection, which we will be shortly celebrating, the Christ. That, of course, is the Christian story, and there's an awful lot more to it. 
But we realize that even though in our Western culture, and you've only to read Shakespeare, Milton, open German or French literature, the literature of most countries of the West, and there is an assumption at least of a knowledge of Christian culture. Even if any of you who are fans of P.G. Woodhouse, the English comic writer, there too there are many references to uh, the Christian deposit of culture. But the fact is that uh, people grow up in a certain culture, they become alienated from it, and it is very difficult indeed to win them back to it. And that is the precise challenge of the new evangelization, and that is why, to some extent, it's already encountering huge difficulties. Because we adapt something we've never heard before much more easily than we assimilate something with which we believe we are familiar, but which we don't understand. So the primary challenge to Christianity, and to Catholicism in particular, is to retell the story in such a way that people understand what is behind it. I often think when I see Chinese or Japanese tourists going around the National Gallery in London and looking at these paintings, so many of them, in fact, which tell with great pathos, with great beauty, and with exquisite uh, artistic skill the Christian story. Do they actually find the paintings beautiful to start with? That's an aesthetic question. But unless they know the story behind it, the true meaning of the painting simply can't come through. Or similarly, in a city like Rome, where Christian symbols are shouting at you all the time, do people actually know what they mean and understand their significance, how they can move people's minds and hearts? Now, even we Catholics who are believers find it difficult, and that's why we have to keep retelling ourselves the story every year, much as the Jews do at Passover when they recount the story of the crossing of the Red Sea at Pashach, we too, at roughly the same time of year, tell again and again and again the story of Jesus' last couple of days on earth. Not because it's a particularly attractive story, it's a rather brutal and horrible one in many respects, but because we believe firmly that in that story lies the deeper mystery of our salvation. I hope I've made that point, that behind the narrative, which needs to be told and retold, because people forget very easily, there is also a story that has to be understood. And that's where we get to the nub of the problem. Now, I consider myself a reasonably educated man. And I'm sure I'm very much less than most of the people here. But I read newspapers. I've read a lot of novels in a variety of languages. I've studied at university. And I've lived in a multicultural city as a pastor for 14 years. But I have to own up immediately that I really don't know Islam terribly well. Mecca doesn't mean a great deal for me. In the car this morning, Mark and I were talking about the Hajj. Yes, I do know what the Hajj is. But do I know what it signifies in the life of a devout Muslim? Do I know the Quran? I heard a number of citations from it during the course of this morning's presentations. But do I know what story it tells? Does it touch my heart? Can I empathize with it? Or above all, and this is the most important thing, if I knew it, would it help me to understand better the world of Islam. And what applies to Islam applies to cultures which are even more alien to me, just as Shinto in Japan, you know, I've seen Madame Butterfly and rather like it, or China. Do I know much about Buddhism or Confucianism or the Asian religions? Do I know what truths are they based on, what values they represent? And so I think this dialogue is then no longer pos not possible unless we start by knowing and understanding. And so I would say that the clue to what you attempt to do, and I admire you for doing it, it's a wonderful achievement, is actually education, but also helping people appreciate the values that underlie the story, the truths about God. Do I and a Hindu have the same concept of the transcendent, for example, or is my way of thinking so determined by the Greco-Roman heritage which has formed my religious uh, consciousness that I cannot engage with somebody who has a more relativist or a pluri 
a multitude of deities. Do we of the monotheistic tradition, and that includes Islam, Judaism, and Christianity in all its various forms, can we enter into meaningful dialogue with uh, Buddhism, for example, where the concept of divinity is very vague indeed, or with the various Hindu religions, which have a variety of deities? So even when we use the word God, are we talking about the same thing? So the one appeal I would make to you in this, and I would hope that this might be my contribution to your deliberations, is uh, to think about how the story is told. To think about understanding people's art, people's customs, all of which are vehicles for meaning. So Pashach is a meal, but it's celebrated in such a way that it's a vehicle for paternal relations with the family, for the assurance that God has entered into people's lives and has walked the walk with them, has liberated people from captivity and set them free. So it raises big questions about our meaning and understanding of freedom, our sense of belonging to one another since we're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and our relationship with God. And what applies in the Judeo-Christian tradition or in Islam will also, I think, analogously apply in the world of Hindu or Buddhist religion. And the final thing I would like to say in my short contribution is that I am endeavoring to facilitate the church in telling another narrative, in helping telling another story. We're coming up very shortly to elections to the European Parliament. I know for some of you this isn't terribly relevant to your lives, but to those of us who live in Europe, the European Union, the European process, the European project is of enormous importance. Because it is my conviction that we have succeeded in living together in peace for over 70 years, because we have decided to pool our resources, to put aside the historic origins of conflict, and to make sacrifices for the common good. Now, pursuit of the common good is at the very heart of Catholic social teaching. And the ideas, the twin ideas of solidarity between people who are different and subsidiarity, namely allowing people to become who they think they are best. So, for example, we heard this morning testimony from the Balkans. I'm from the west of Ireland. The climate is different. The food is different. But also our ways of thinking are different. But my way of doing things is no more valid than yours. And so I have to be able to pursue my ideals and to allow you to pursue yours. And this applies in the areas of church-state relations in the various countries of the European Union. It applies also to our culinary traditions and also to our parliamentary traditions. So the one great dividing line in much of Europe is that most of Europe has constitutional a codified law and others have common law. So those are, should we suppress one and allow the other to take over? And we've decided, no, that we will have unity in diversity. And just I would like to finish by reflecting on the fact that we have huge difficulty in telling the European story. And that we're now in the third generation of the European Union. All the young people here, your students who are from Europe, have all been born within the European Union. They don't know what it was like before. And uh, it's important, I think, that we retell that story. That we do think and remember that we have made war on one another. That we have liquidated a serious part of our population. That we have conspired in enormous atrocities against other human beings. In the name of culture, by the way, because our culture was superior and the Untermensch had to disappear. So that intercultural dialogue means mutual appreciation. And that appreciation can only deepen if we have mutual understanding. And that understanding can only grow if we know a little about one another, but also if we are tolerant of one another as well. If I'm tolerant of nations that eat horse meat, for example, which I don't eat myself, and they're tolerant of Irish stew, which is, you know, mutton, not very delicious. Or if we're tolerant of the way people dress differently, the, dre the different dress codes. Or if you, who are not a believer, are tolerant of me practicing my religion, having that freedom. So I would say, in, and I hope that these few reflections will help you, uh, they don't recount a success story, 
but I think that they, what I would hope to contribute is certain elements to our understanding of how best we can move forward together, how we can actually solve conflict. And I've always discovered as a pastor, and this was the golden rule I applied in my own life as a priest, uh, operating a parish and trying to help people on their journey of faith. You have to meet people where they are. You may want to bring them someplace else, but you can only cajole them. You can't force them. And I think that if the way we live our lives, the way our convictions, be they Christian or other, refine our humanity, make us people other people want to be with, then uh, the dialogue process will be facilitated, our understanding of one another's cultural parameters will be widened, our appreciation of what we do for and with one another will be deepened. And I think that unity, our common humanity, the values we all share, the religious truths which are fundamental to all who believe in God, a God who loves his people, uh, will unite us eventually.